Okay, uh, so a couple other announcements. Uh, Lisa is our, TR, is our TRG uh, TC, Transaction Coordinator, for only $275 to do all your paperwork. We're getting great comments from agents that have worked uh, with her. Uh, tomorrow, Thursday noon, our lunch and learn, we'll have James uh, from AAA Inspections uh, back. So uh, you're welcome to bring your questions for him. Um, and NAR, uh, their, what is it, Dr. Yoon? Uh, yeah, their chief economist. Their chief, chief economist, this is on a national level, has uh, released some presentations. Um, if you want the full thing, contact Danny or me, and we'll be glad to forward it to you. There, there's some great information uh, on here. It's about an hour plus program, but I wanted to go through uh, a few of the slides here this morning because I thought it was I thought it was pretty interesting. So uh, is this where we're starting here? Yeah. Okay. So uh, jobs. This is how the job market has changed today versus pre-COVID days. And so we're looking at June. These are all June uh, stats. If you notice, the main thing, California, uh, we're back. We're just back to uh, what we were pre uh, pre-COVID. Uh, but a lot of these states, like Texas and, and Florida. Uh, they actually have more jobs uh, now in some some um, of the northern east northeast states have less like less jobs. Idaho and Nevada. Yeah, you can see where the population <laughs> is going. Also, uh, it's it's changed there. Okay, so these are the uh, number of sales, and you can see the drop during COVID. So again, this isn't values, this is just the, the gross numbers of sales. So you can see that trend has it's definitely been- dropped. National, not just California. Yeah, not California. This is all, all national stats. Uh, so basically all of this year, you can see how the number of sales, and you can see it in our stats here, even on a, on a, on a very local basis here for, uh, for our office how the numbers have, have dropped. Um, but, you know, we're probably back to pre-COVID uh, numbers. It's just that afterwards when those rates were really low, those, the numbers spiked uh, very high. Okay? And this is that V-check that everybody talked about. They didn't know what shape it was going to be. This yeah. is what it is. <laughs> uh, pending, the number of pending sales. Uh, if you look at that, uh, that bar there, the red bar, is supposed to be the, the norm. And you can see that, uh, again, this coincides with the number of sales. We've dropped, dropped below that as of, as of this year. Inventory. And this is uh, January. It's the January, so you can see. And this is a 20-year, 20 22-year span here for our inventory. So our inventory is still very low. When you look at it statistically over decades, what does that mean? That's, that means we're still in a strong seller's market. There's still gonna be uh, 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 price uh, pressure on, on prices to, to stay up. Okay, we're still- And usually what this is the national never looked like California, but now it looks like California. So we saw this all a decade before. Now everybody's coming to the same reality that we had. Price adjustments from list price. So this is if you've been on the market uh, just a, a week versus three or four months, you can see how uh, how price adjustments go, and we we know that. Um, oh, this is this is very interesting because historically, uh, Jonathan, I think we've always had about that uh, two to three percent spread between the Fed fund rate and what mortgage rates are. And I was always taught that the thirty year is all tied to that ten year uh, Treasury uh, uh, bond rate. So. You can see that the interest rates have adjusted before the Fed rates. So it's all in anticipation because all the press is saying, oh, yeah, the Feds are going to raise rates, Feds are going to raise rates. 
interest rates go crazy. They've doubled in the last year, and the Fed fund rates go up a half a percent. Three quarters of percent. Yeah. yeah. So, so that January is obviously going to have a hump eventually. So <laughs> you can see all, all of this period here where the Fed funds rates is still low. It's only recently has it gone up, but the uh, interest rates have gone up much sooner, much earlier. So my prediction is that I think we've peaked at, at these at these rates because it's gonna it's gonna level off considering the economy. And I was just talking to Danny. You know, I was always taught that a recession is two. You can talk on this. So a recession is two quarters of negative uh, GDP, right? Well, until, until Wikipedia got edited five hundred times. <laughs> yeah. So we've actually gone through two quarters of negative GDP, but. The politicians are saying no, we're not in a recession. <laughs> so the elections coming up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but we were in a recession during COVID, which was only a two-month, three-month period. That was a recession, and we didn't have negative GDP for two. So I guess it's very politicized as to what a recession is or not. But if you remember our economist that comes every year, he says, you know, it's normal that we get all of these small recessions and then you know every five ten years we get a bigger one not as big as the great recession of the six or seven but we are, we're always in these little recessions so i'm, I'm interested in what he uh, uh identifies if we are actually in a recession or not but when you look it up now the, the, they say no we're not in a recession so we'll see uh so um uh this is uh, again, num uh, home sales. If we look at, there's a projection there. If we go back to that. Bottom line: This is the, the market is good. If you look, this is a 20-year picture of the number of home sales. You know, we're just spoiled now because we had so much activity over this last uh, couple of years with those three percent interest rates. Okay. Uh, international buyers, we're getting uh, fewer uh, international buyers, foreign buyers, for less number of cash buyers. I think we got a stat here. Um, on uh, cash buyers, it was less, but there's there's still a, a big percentage of the market, maybe 15, 20% of the market. Uh, this Fannie Mae is a good time to buy. Forecast. What is forecast? So, total, total, total sales. Oh, okay. So there, the, the NAR is forecasting home prices to be up 11% this year and 2% next year. So, uh, and in 21, we did like 17%, 10%. I'm not seeing any predictions of any. Um, uh, lower market prices yet. Is it just in the day? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Okay. All right. So again, this is uh, the Economist speaks for about an hour and a half uh, on this. Uh, one one last tip, Scott. I know we, we talked about this uh, a few months ago. Scott is a, a farmer in the in the Lamita area, and he's been successful this year in mainly contacting owners and letting them, letting them know what their home values are, right? Do you want to yeah. make a comment or anything? I showed a, I showed a flyer that uh, he was passing out. Uh, and I think it's just really important that that is one thing that we should be focusing on. There's still a lot of sellers that don't know how valuable their, their homes are. Yeah, uh, the trick is to just be consistent. You know, if I've been to a lot of realtors over the years, they, they start, they drop out, they start to drop out. Like, there every month. So this month I'll probably get to get two listings plus two even some of So it is you can do the numbers, crunch the numbers, it costs about 23 cents for a two-sided color flyer. You know, you're making a big commission. I sold one last month and made it for 1.5. So uh just stay consistent and stay at it, it works for you. Yeah, and I'm and I'm so amazed at, at again how many sellers don't know. What, what their home values are. And if they're on that fence, if they're thinking about moving out of state, uh, this might be a good time to uh, get them 
little nudge, especially with a lot of the press saying that, hey, you know, we're looking at, you know, 20, 30, 40% decreases in values. I don't believe that, but I mean, that's something that could uh, push a seller to, to make that move now rather than, rather than they you know. Oh, oh, good. That's really yeah. interesting. Because I couldn't read the whole article with the New York Times and it gets, yeah. but that's very interesting. Yeah, I think it says the New York, uh, the, uh, New York Times did an article. Uh, you're, you're hearing these companies that have these, I, they call them I buyers. You know, I'll buy, that they'll buy your house. Don't use a realtor. Yeah. Save the commissions. You will net more money going through us. That was the advertisements from uh, Open Door Open Door Labs. This is a big company. It's too good to be true. It's, it's usually not real. <laughs> yeah, so the Federal Trade Commission uh, filed a lawsuit against them. Uh, they just got billed $62 million in a fine that they're paying. So it shows you- That's just for 2018, 2019. Yeah, that, and that was, yeah, 2018, thank you. Uh, that was from a couple of years so they ago. Have, I mean, they've been around for a while. It's not like they just opened up. Uh, and, and there's a quote in there. Do you have that on the uh, newspaper? I think it was the last line. This is the, the pay thing. Uh, I think it's the other one too soon. Yeah, the other one has like, you have to be a subscriber, I think, before. Uh, yeah, so in the, the New York uh, Times article, uh, this is how they advertise it as you know, getting market value for it, you know, being the latest coolest thing, and it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, in the reality, they actually lost thousands of dollars compared to selling on the on the traditional on the traditional market. Uh, so, in the newspaper article, they actually interviewed Open Door. They said that yes, we're going to pay the fine, but we disagree with the findings. You know, obviously, and the. Uh, one of the FTC investigators said that uh, you know, bottom line is they're just they're just deceiving the customer. And it's it's just, it's been going on for a long time. Good path. Uh, so it's a, it's a very good article if you if you run into this type of a competition to educate your your sellers. We and we all know that. In fact, we've had uh, two transactions. Uh, Ted uh, Porter. Uh, we we're just talking. He was uh, actually involved in two transactions where they're, you know, trying to sell the property without putting it on the market, a listing it, a quote listing agent, and it's like, how unethical is that in in this in this marketplace? Uh, and I don't know about you, but I'm getting emails at least on a weekly basis that say, hey, if you have any off market listings, call me. Yeah. You know, well, that should is not a red flag to everybody that. Who, who wants to be involved in an off-market listing and get sued by that seller later on? Because attorneys will will find them, represent them for free, and sue everybody for not putting it on the market. And you can't win. Uh, the CAR attorneys, when we when we did our roundtable discussions, they have all these cases that that they've heard about these lawsuits, but. They've all been settled. So they've never been able to actually set one as a precedent because the insurance companies and the brokerages just pay because they know they can't win. You know, they they, they know there's there's too much, there's too many statistics showing that when you put it on the market, you're gonna get market value. You're not gonna get it with a with a pocket listing, you know. Uh, my dad used to do that, but we just don't do that anymore. So you you have to put it on. On the MLS and this in this type of market. Okay, I got off of my, my soapbox. Any comments, questions before we get into our our program? Yeah, I have because you know I just say I mentioned you know that, that I have two people that want to sell, and I did tell them one of them I said you know if I list your property I can probably list over two for five you know and basically I think they still said no I want two for three and that's what I want you know in this case what do you suggest. I have never met a seller. <laughs> well, well, I'm at one. I'm at one. You know, I have one. Yeah, but when they I talk to the attorney, <laughs> when they talk to the attorney a, a year or two from now and said, you know, you could have gotten 3.5. Do I put that in writing case? That we yeah, have, they need to sign to, it. You have to sign it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And, and they need to get professional, an, an outside professional advice. 
I just never met that animal. I mean, I've, I've had other agents say that, oh yeah, you know, they don't want to be bothered. You know, they don't want open houses. They don't want this, they don't want that. And they want to sell it off the market. I have never, I have never met one that, was, that really knows what they're talking about. I mean, if they think your house is worth 2 million and you're offering them three, you're going to jump at it. But the reality is it's probably worth 3.5. Yeah. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, and, and when we represent them, we, we are a fiduciary. Yeah. So we can't tell them to take the three million and walk. We just we can't. We can't do that. It's not in their best interest. Because you can list a property. You don't have to show it. You don't have to do open houses. Uh, all all the times when I've shown income property, there's no showings on income properties. Yeah. You put in offers, right? And you'll know within a week or two. Then take the three minutes. I mean, it's to me, it's very black and white. Okay. Put that stuff on. All right. Let me introduce uh, uh, Stu, Stu Levy. See, Stu and I will go back a long time through Rotary. He's a past president of, of Rotary. Uh, our, this is our preferred vendor CPA. He'll answer your questions. They'll take phone calls twenty four seven about tax questions. And he's actually a very good poker player and he takes money from me all the time. <laughs> uh, Stu, it's, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, and you're welcome to take that off. Well, you know, one of the issues is, so I, I tested this morning, I don't have COVID, but I've got like a tremendously bad summer cold. <laughs> and I'm gonna give you a, a, a warning in advance. When I sneeze, it sounds like a cartoon. It, it really is a uncomfortable sneeze. So if I do sneeze, I'm sorry in advance. Um, I was listed for two things today. I'm going to add a third thing. Um, we were talking about 1031 exchanges and um, estate tax. I also wanted to add in, I noticed the chart where people are moving. Those are all tax preferred, preferred <laughs> states. Texas, there's no tax. Obama, there's no tax. I have a bunch of clients who have moved there or have bought property there. And they're trying to unload it because they do not want to move there. Idaho in the winter is not what anybody expects. So uh, Idaho, Idaho in the winter is not what anybody, I'll give this a shot. If I do sneeze, I'm warning you guys. <laughs> oh, good point. <laughs> um, Idaho in the winter is not what anybody expects. Um, the, first winter, the first winter my daughter moved there, it snowed. She, she's native. Her husband has lived in the East Coast, but she's native. How did you do that? You know, I'm from the East Coast, and I don't particularly care for snow. Um, we had a, my sister-in-law is about five foot tall, and we had a snowstorm one day, and she was coming to our house um, before she was married to my brother, but she couldn't get home, so she was coming to our house, and my brother and I met her at the bus station, and we had to pick her up because the snow was above her waist, and she couldn't walk, so I'm not that tall either, so, but it's, so snow is a bad thing. Anyway, just so you're aware, People who buy there sometimes want to come back. So my my suggestion to people, I know this is not necessarily popular with realtors, is don't sell your California home, rent your California home, and after a year, then you sell your California home if you're still happy there. I've got three clients moving back this year. So that's uh, unfortunately only one of them took my advice. And so they sold a really nice house in Redondo Beach and they're buying a not as nice house in North Redondo. So it's uh anyway that's that uh 1031 exchanges that's a, a question i get a lot of about 1031 exchanges there are some very specific rules of 1031 exchanges and somebody like phil atwan right that 1030 i can't remember the name of the company but you all know uh he can tell you the specifics of these important things there are two things that matter to me first of all the closing date of the purchase has to be 180 days or less after the sale. You can't get around that. That is the most important thing. The other most important thing is the seller needs to be the buyer. I got a call the other day. Um, my parents are selling their house in a 1031 exchange and they're going to buy a new property so my husband and I can go on title with them. Um, and then ultimately there it's going to be our house. So many things wrong with that. You're selling a property for a million dollars. You're buying a property for a million dollars. You need to 
have that whole million dollar purchase. If if I go in and I give you three hundred thousand dollars for that million dollar purchase, you've got a three hundred thousand dollar boot or gain, and so you can't do that. So okay. if you're going to sell for a million dollars and buy for a million five, and I want to buy the extra five hundred thousand, there's there's ways to do that, but basically the, you have to sell for what you bought. There's debt calculations in there as well, but that's the very simple version of it. The other thing is I'm a partnership. Four of us are in a partnership, sell our property. If you and I want to do 1031 exchanges, you just you two just want to be done with it. We can't do that. We have to first distribute the property to ourselves. Then we have to sell the property as individuals. Now there are rules out there that say it needs to be that way for two years. I'm not necessarily convinced of that, but I would I if you know you're going to sell it and you know that's going to be your plan, I would certainly as soon as you can bifurcate that property uh, to the four of us. It's a nice place. I don't know where you want to sell it, um, but uh, because you can't, the partnership can't sell, and an individual do the 1031 to the uplay. It just doesn't work that way. The seller has to be the buyer. Black and white. That's very simple. And again, the 180 day rule is the other thing. What we have done in the past, and I'm, we have said, I'm going to buy a new house and I'm going to move into it in two years. And so I'm going to sell my rental property. I'm going to buy a rental property and I'm going to rent it for two years and then I'm going to move into it. We actually had a circumstance where the lady, and may she rest in peace, she was a lovely lady. She decided that she didn't want anyone to live in that house before she moved in. So she advertised it twice market rent and never got anybody to move in. And after two years, she moved in. So very okay. under, it is unethical. <laughs> um, I'm thinking that if the IRS were to audit it, they would have said, well, of course you didn't rent it. You, you were offering it a twice market rent. Um, we're going to disallow it. So yeah, there's something out there that says you can't do that. But that's the other thing is, and you always hear, and again, this is this is my preference. I'm a CPA. I make my own decisions. You've always heard it's got to be two years um, as a rental, right? or in the case with us, it's got to be two years as individual property. I think it's a slightly different approach than that. I want to see it on two tax returns. So if we sell the property in December. And so we've, we've dispersed it to ourselves in December. And so it's going to show up on our tax returns as a Schedule E or rental property in December of that year. And then it's a rental property the next year. I don't have a problem before December of the third year um, doing the exchange. So this way it shows up on two tax returns. If it can show up on three, that's even better. But two tax returns is to me the minimum you want to show up. So I think it is a... I don't want to say it's an underhanded thing to do, but it's a creative way to get around that rule. So that's it. Any other questions about 1031 exchanges of how to, oh, one more thing. When you sell your property or sell your rental property in California and you buy the rental property in Idaho, there's a reporting required annually for the state of California, as long as you're here, that you didn't sell that property. And because if you, if you defer to gain of a hundred of $500,000, and then you move into Idaho, and then you sell that property in Idaho, California is entitled to the tax on that $500,000. If you sell it for only a $400,000 gain, California only gets to tax $400,000. If you sell it for $600,000 gain, California gets to tax the $500,000. There's a, a other state tax credit available, so you're not paying more tax than you would have, but you're still, you have to be aware that California requires you to affirm every year that you did not sell that property. And that's because you're deferring those- You're deferring the California gain to one another. Oh, so that's they true. really want to make sure of that. Happens. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, California, from my standpoint, um, everybody's afraid of the IRS because they're really not nice people. California makes uh, the IRS collection people look like teddy bears. There is no, there is no room for maneuver. If you, 
let's say you file your tax return um, in October and you owed $1,000 to the IRS. Well, the IRS is going to penalize you half a percent a month because you needed to pay them that money in April. And it's an extension of time to file, not of time to pay. So you're going to pay a half a percent penalty every month you pay late. California doesn't have an extension. And so California says, we're 5% a month. And so if you pay your tax in October that you really should have paid in April, you're paying 5% a month penalty. Yeah, that's a lot of money. And so, and there's no, there's almost no wiggle room. Um, we have, I'm working right now and I'm really hoping it works. A client sold a business and it was one of these convoluted business sales where he got some money, but he wasn't sure if that money was a loan or if that money was part of the sale price. The final documents finally came in June of this year. And it was a lot more sale than we thought it was. And so when we reported the, the tax to California, he owed a $50,000 penalty. I am working really hard on making that penalty go away. Uh, there is a form, there is um, a, a dedicated form to the Franchise Tax Board, it's called 2917 if anybody cares. And you submit that form, in theory, they review it. And honestly, their answer is usually no. So that's what, but I, the IRS, if it's the first time you're facing a penalty, they'll say, fine, we're not gonna charge you. Franchise tax board, it's our money. So come pay it to us. So they are very difficult. So if you're gonna, if you look that you're gonna owe money to the feds and money to the state, always pay the state first. It's much harder to get an installment arrangement with. It's much harder to get out of penalties and interest with the state. You never get out of interest, but you can always get out of penalties with the feds, almost always. Um, but you want to, if you've got to make a decision, I've got $100 and I owe $100 to the fed and $100 to the state, pay the $100 to the state and owe the money to the feds and deal with them later. So that's it. Now, are there any other questions about that? Yes, sir. I, I'm not yes, sure sir. Uh, uh, if it's still the same, you know, but uh, I remember back in the, the memory lane here that when you had a loan on the property, that you had to replace on the new property with the right. same amount of loan. Is that still the That same? is correct, because otherwise you're getting debt relief. Yeah. So if I have a half a million dollar loan on the property, and I sell for a million dollars, and I buy a property for a million dollars cash, then I've got a half a million dollars debt relief. So that's that's so, um, that's, gotta, gotta, gotta that's income. so what you have to do there is get the half a million dollar loan and then pay it off within two years. So, yes, ma'am. I own the property in Idaho. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't live there. So it's a good place to fish. <laughs> it's not anywhere near fishing. Oh. Um, when I sell this rental property, do I pay ca any taxes to Idaho? Because really. Well, you've got but, uh, do I pay taxes to California at the same time? Because my sale would be up there. Yeah. And especially if I not if I don't buy anything else, I'm done and I have to pay capital gains right. here. So I'm gonna say one thing first and then I'll get back to your question. Okay. Capital gains are not bad. Capital gains rates are lower than ordinary income tax rates. I can't tell you how many times people come into me and say, Oh, I don't want to pay capital gains tax. Yes, you do. The maximum capital gains rate is 23.8%. The maximum federal income tax rate is 37%. Yeah. If I'm in the 37% bracket and I experience a capital gain, I pay tax at 23.8% on that capital gain. Mm -hmm. Capital gains are not bad. Please disavow all of your clients about bad capital gains. Capital gains are bad. Taxes are bad. Capital gains taxes are the best of those. So now to your question. If you are, <clears throat> I have a client who lives in Scotland and they make money in Scotland and they make money in the US, but they are US citizens. As a US citizen, they pay tax on their worldwide income. And, but they get a credit for the tax they pay to Scotland. In your case, you're a California resident and you've got property in Idaho, which is kind of like a farm. And when you sell the property in Idaho, you will pay tax in Idaho. And as a California resident, you will pay tax in California, but you'll get a credit for the tax you pay to Idaho. The tax rates in Idaho are lower than they are in California. So, so you, if you have a $100,000 gain, you're paying, first of all, the $100,000 capital gain in, in the feds. On your California return, you'll report $100,000 capital gain. 
and your Idaho return, you'll report $100,000 for capital gain. You'll pay tax in Idaho, and then you'll get a credit in California for the tax you pay to Idaho. So you're not paying more than you would have so if you just sold to California. So it's almost, it almost balances out that it's like I'm paying one time. Absolutely. Okay. And it's that way if you if you work in Idaho or if you, whatever income you have in multiple states, the, um, it's not that way with all countries, but within the states, we all have um, other state tax credits. And so you get to, if you pay tax through one state, you get a credit in your resident state for the tax you pay in the other state. Uniform commercial code. Something to do with that. I don't remember, but I remember that. Any other 1031 questions? Okay, since I'm, You're next. since I'm probably rich and cash poor and I want to sell this building and actually keep a few bucks out, what type of tax do I pay? So, I mean, the capital gains, state and federal, and what I take out, but what about depreciation? So, what depreciation does, you buy the property for, and I'll use really simple numbers because. I got told I can't think about. You bought the property for hundred thousand dollars, and you've depreciated twenty thousand dollars. So now your basis is eighty dollars, eighty thousand dollars. You sell it for two hundred thousand dollars. You've got a gain of one hundred twenty thousand dollars. Under the current depreciation rules, you'll pay tax on one hundred twenty thousand dollars. I will caution you: California does not have a capital gains concept. For California, it's all ordinary income, so you're going to run right up to that nine point three percent, and sometimes higher. 13.3 uh, is the highest rate that California charges, but you got to have a lot of money. Um, but I might suggest, and so you're going to cash it out, you're not going to replace the property at all. I, I am going to, but I'd like to just do somehow. So, how about let me make this suggestion do the full 1031 exchange, then once you're in the property, get a loan against the property. Okay. You still need to wait another year, but yeah. so if you desperately yeah. need to cash, it doesn't work. But, um, that would be the way I would do it because under the 2017 Tax Act, which is going to come up later, under the 2017 Tax Act, you can't deduct more than one resident on your on your itemized deduction, more than one loan on your item, or more than one property loan on your itemized deduction. Um, you can go as high as you want for rental property. So you can get a $10 million loan on a rental property and deduct it. Now you have to watch. Because right, if you borrow all that money out of your property, and this is this is what happened in, in the 1980s and 2000, people borrowed money against their rental properties and then sold it, had these huge capital gains, but all their money was borrowed out of it, so they had to pay tax on their money. So you just have to be cautious. Hello, what the heck do you want? We can't break all the rest. It's 23.8. Uh, percent for capital gain. That's the highest capital gain. Rate. And for Fed, it was what? No, no. So the, red, the ordinary tax rate uh -huh. on the federal taxes maxes out at 37%. And that's at like five or $600,000 of income. Capital gains maxes out at 23.8. What it really is, and to give you much more information than you could possibly want, it's a 20% capital gain rate. And it's a 3.8% Affordable Care Act tax. So that it's an additional Medicare tax that helps pay for health insurance for those who are getting subsidized. <laughs> yes, sir. I have a complicated question. It's about an installment scale for the 1031. Let's say that you're the seller, you're selling for a million dollars, you're exchanging it to another partner for a million dollars, but that seller over there wants to take the money on an installment sale and they want to spread it out over five years. So it's, it's a million to a million. But they're not going to get that that money right away. I'm going to have to. Pay so you are the buyer or the seller? Was that you're buying the property on an installment sale? Uh, yeah. Then you just have debt. Then that's not a problem. If, if you're so if you if you're buying my property for a million dollars, but you're I'm carrying an eight hundred thousand dollar loan, that's an eight hundred thousand dollar loan. If you have that's that that's wonderful for a ten thirty one exchange. Yes. Um, I heard that if you. Sell your property. If you live in it five years, you get, you know, the five hundred. But if you sell it, let's say, or rent it for two of those five years, you get the five thousand. I mean, five hundred. So the rule, the rule, and the two, and the two year for exchange. Is, uh, All right. So that's a that's a good question, actually. 
much more multi-level than I expected. Yes. Yes. So the rule under section 121, and this is only one of three code sections that I remember. Uh, <laughs> under section 121, you have to have lived in your house for two of the five years before you sold. So what we do with the people who are moving to Idaho, who aren't sure that they want to sell their property in California, is we have them move to Idaho and rent the property in California. So then after two years, they say, you know what? I love Idaho. I'm going to sell my property in California. Well, they still qualify. It's $250,000 a person. It's $500,000 for a married couple. And so if, if it's, if it's, so you sell the property and you've got a, you've got a 200,000, you've got a, uh, you've got a 1031 exchange you want to do, you knock off $500,000 on the first, and then you exchange the balance. You're deferring the game. You should have it rented for two years. Yeah. You can't do what my client did and say, I'm going to rent it for twice as much and not rent it out. Two years are just two tax periods, right? You're saying if you actually rent it out in December, you don't have that year. No, it's got to be, if I move out of the house on today's August 3rd, August 3rd. You want two calendar years. I have to, I have to, I have to have sold the house by this, by August 3rd, 2025. Okay. And again, have to close. That's a hard close date. So you might ask, how do you know what day I moved out? That's an interesting question, isn't it? I don't have your answer. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about uh, if you have uh, uh, a, a partnership. Uh, what about a, a trust? What about a, I'm going to sell? It, it's my income property, but I, I formed a trust with my kids on it. Do I have to liquidate that trust before I do the 1031? So, who are the beneficiaries of the trust? Let's say it's my two kids. So, if the if it's a trust, that's a little more complicated. But if the trust is selling it, and the trust is buying the new property, it doesn't matter. And you, I don't think you want to distribute the property out of your trust to your kids. So. That's that gets into a state tax. It's not going to be there in a minute. More ten thirty one. Okay. You look like you're going to say something. You just want to raise me. Um, okay. So, in two thousand seventeen, Congress passed the new tax act, and they took the estate tax exemption from five million to ten million. And this adjusts for inflation every year. And at that point, they had the concept of something called portability. So if I die and my, uh, my, my joint wife, um, estate with my wife is $12 million, well, or $10 million, in 2017, I said, well, you know, how much are things going to go up? And I'm dead anyway, so I can't opine but maybe we won't file a 706. If we had filed a 706 and our estate was $10 million, we would have claimed nothing on my estate return because everything would have been done as a spousal transfer. So my estate got zero charged against it and everything went to my wife with a stepped up basis. And then my wife would have had something called portability of the $10 million exclusion. So when she dies, whatever the exclusion is, is has $10 million added to it. This is such a complicated concept and I do have a handout that I will show you in a minute. But what happened was in 2017, everybody said, well, how much are things gonna go up and how bad is it gonna be when the exclusion goes back down? The exclusion is scheduled uh, by law to go down in January of 2026 to $5 million plus increases for inflation over that period from 2017 to 2026. So basically, if, if 5 million went to, if 10 million went to 12.6, which is where it is now, we can assume that 6.3 is probably where that state exclusion would be if everything stopped now. So in 2026, I have a taxpayer who died last year and he had, his total estate was about probably, let's say $5 million. And so we did the estate return and we charged $5 million to his estate. The exclusion was $12 million in round numbers. So we took $7 million and handed it to his wife. When his wife dies, even if she dies after 2026 and the estate exemption is down at $6 million, 
she's going to have an estate that's usually 13 million because she got seven from her husband and six from herself. So if the properties continue to go through the roof and her other investments continue to go through the roof, she at least has a $13 million exemption as opposed to the six million that she would have had otherwise. And it doesn't make any sense to anybody, does it? <laughs> because it is a really complicated thing. Normally I write stuff down, but I didn't do that. So I'm going to spread these out for me. I'll spread them out on this side. <laughs> So this is like some of this on the friend who speaks regularly at the same thing. Yeah. Very good. Let's see, you get away from yourself. Okay. I even put on my glasses so I can read. I might have to keep one so I, I have something to do. Right. <laughs> you take that one and I'll keep this one. I promise I can do it. Yeah. Okay. So, husband Doc, the estate is $14 million. We have an extra one. Danny can have one. Here we go. Okay. You just hold on to that. Elvie. You're going to draw on it. Oh, wonderful. Okay. So, the value of the estate is $14 million. 50% community property. The husband takes $7 million on his return. He's got an estate exclusion. I'm sorry, $7 million. We give the $7 million directly to the wife. There's no taxable estate. We've got $12 million that goes wanting. Nobody's going to do anything with that $12 million. If you didn't do anything with that $12 million, and there's a little box on the 706 that says portability, it's on page three, halfway down the page, and it's one number that's easily overlooked. So the wife dies, and now the estate hasn't appreciated at all, and the estate's worth $14 million. Well, she's only got a $12 million exclusion. So she's going to pay tax on $2 million, $14 million minus 12, and she's going to pay $800,000 in estate tax. Estate tax is always 40%. But when you say she, it means her estate. Her estate, is, yeah, she's dead. You only pay estate tax if you're dead, which is why I don't understand why people are so upset about estate tax. <laughs> um, but, and there's actually another reason estate tax is very good. I'll go there in a second. So, but if the portability was elected, the wife dies, the estate's worth $14 million. She's got her $12 million and her husband's $12 million. Her exclusion is $24 million. Her estate doesn't pay any tax. This is a wonderful thing. This is as simple an example as you can get. But it is, it is kind of an important example. The reason that this is now coming to focus, because this has been this way since 2017, is that if you didn't, if you file an estate return in 2017, 18, 19, and didn't elect portability, and then you realize suddenly, oh crap, first of all, the estate exclusion is going down, even though you knew that before. <laughs> um, even though the estate exclusion is going down, you didn't think of that before. And all of your assets have appreciated tremendously. Let's say you only have stock in Google. And so now your assets are really high and you say, crap, I should have elected portability. And so there's a way to get portability. It is to request a private letter ruling from the IRS. And that is as daunting as it sounds. It's a very expensive and very time consuming process. And the IRS said, you know what? We don't want to deal with this. So on, I think it was two Mondays ago, they released RevProc, Revenue Procedure, 2022-32, which that's another one that I remember, which said, you now have five years to file your estate tax return. So I do have a client whose assets are primarily in Google and Apple and Qualcomm. And when her husband died in 2018, they weren't worth that much. Now they're worth a lot of money. And her children have said to her, you know, when you die, we don't want to pay estate tax. We should file an estate tax return for that. Because we didn't need to file an estate tax return for him. His estate was worth less than $12 million. So we didn't have to do anything. And But now we're going to go back and file an estate tax return for him. And we're going to say that he gave everything to his wife on a spousal transfer. And so she's going to have a $12 million portability. 
And then when she dies, whatever the estate um, exclusion is when she dies, she's going to add $12 million to it. So her heirs are going to save that much money at the state. That's a very, very important concept for any of you who represent um, people who have been widowed or widowed or that's the right word. But since 2018, this is something that could be very important to them because that's a lot of money. 40% is a lot of tax. And we don't ever want anybody to pay 40% tax. So now that I've befuddled you all with this <laughs> stupid man. <laughs> any questions I can answer in one word? <laughs> when, <laughs> when did your husband die? 2009. 2009, you didn't have to work. Okay. The estate exclusion was around $5 million, $4 million at that point. And um, you didn't need to file an estate return if there was no estate return. But if he died in 2018, you would want to... Now, and it's going to be a pain in the ass, right? Because you've got to get values for all of your assets at 2018, which, by the way, the lady brought to me yesterday. Values for all of, um, all of her assets. She got a Schwab print out from that date. And she had a, a very nice realtor writer a letter that says, I think your house was worth this much. And we're going to take all that, all that, all those assets and transfer it to her. So he has got the whole $12 million to carry over. And at that point, it's like, 2018, I think it was 11 million eight or 11 million or so. Mm -hmm. And but we're going to transfer that all to her. Now there's, <clears throat> I know Congress is never going to do anything independently anymore. But um, so statutorily, that estate tax exclusion goes down to about a, everybody's expecting to be about six million dollars in 2026. But there's a lot of talk about moving that estate tax exemption down to three million dollars. Mm -hmm. And if they move that estate tax exemption down to three million dollars, guess what? This lady has got a $15 million exemption because she's got the 3 million that's hers and the 12 million that came from her husband. So that's a very important concept. So find out when, you're, when your client's spouse has passed away because this, this could be life-changing and actually not for them, for their heirs because they won't care. Does it have to be within the last five years to make the change? Um, if, they, if they died from 2018 forward, yeah. then you can file the... Um, the 706. And I, does that make sense? Because the, the law didn't come, the law came into effect in 2008. And the one last thing I want to say, the reason why the estate tax is good, and it's good for many more people than it's bad. I don't know if you know this, the Yankees are the best team in baseball. Historically, forever. I know the Dodgers have a better record right now, but the Yankees are the best team in baseball. When George Steinbrenner died, he died in 2010. 2010 was a very special year. The estate tax exchange, the estate tax was going to expire in 2010. And George Steinbrenner died in December, in July of 2010. In December of 2010, the Congress said, you know what? We have an estate tax. And so anybody who died during 2010 is going to have to pay estate tax. And so George Steinbrenner's family and somebody else, I can't remember who it was. I wanted to say it was Baldwin, but it wasn't. He died in a different year. Sued the federal government and said, you can't do that. This is, this is our money. And so in 2010, you had the option of treating it as though there was an estate tax or there wasn't an estate tax. George Steinbrenner and people like George Steinbrenner treated it as though there was no estate tax. People like me who don't have the kind of money that's gonna cost me estate tax are very happy that there's an estate tax because without an estate tax, when my spouse dies, I don't get a step up in basis to fair market that. When my, my wife and I die, my kids don't get a step up in fair market value. And so all this, all this equity that we've built up is now going to be taxed as capital gains, but um, it's still going to be taxed. So the estate tax, I know a lot of people think the estate tax is a terrible thing. And the George Steinbrenners of the world can think the estate tax is a terrible thing. It's really not. It's for 99% of the people it is a very good thing. I see Dirk is out there with the hook. Yeah, well, I disagree about the Yankees. But yeah. <laughs> How many world championships does it have? Yeah. <laughs> just curious. Is it 27? Just give, just give us some time. <laughs> That's going to have to be a long time. Stu actually has seats uh, in his office from the Yankee Stadium. Yeah, when they tore down Yankee Stadium, it was near I turned 50, and that was my birthday gift to myself. Yeah.
It was the most expensive gift I ever bought for anybody, including my wife's engagement ring, which yeah. is a nice ring. <laughs> but um, it was it was very worth it. He's a diehard Yankee fan. Thank you very much. I'm so thank sorry. I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, if there's any questions, I, I think I have a thousand cards there. I can leave more if you'd like. Um, any other questions, always feel free to call me not 24 hours a day. I'm really get pissed <laughs> off at the really early morning phone calls. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Thank you, folks. Okay, so we still have a drawing. Uh, we have two drawings. One is for a gift card for those agents that are present. Did everybody get a wrap up again? Are we ready? Yes. All right, so the last four numbers, two, four, zero, six. Oh. <laughs> hey, Jamie. Okay, Jamie, so that is a, what is that? $25 Starbucks. Starbucks, Ooh, easily $25. Okay, so, so the next one is drawn from all 250 plus agents, but you have to be present to win. And how many cards is it? Uh, oh, probably 10 or 11. Okay. Oh, wow. We'll and see. Let's see who the winner is. We still don't have the music from this, Danny. <laughs> okay. I still have the confetti. Oh, my grid. Almost. <laughs> Just missed Almost, it. Almost, Mike. Just missed it. <laughs> Elizabeth will read that one of our new agents. One notch off. Wow. Okay, so it's going to uh, increase another card for uh, next month. Again, you have to be present oh, to win. Wow. Uh, we have we have bagels and donuts and cake. donuts and and we have cheesecake. So we have cheesecake. lots of lots of non calories last year. Uh, and we're going to leave the AC on, so you guys are welcome to hang around as long as you want, eat as much as you want. <laughs> August birthdays. August birthdays. How many? How uh, many August birthday birthdays do we have? We got oh, wow. here. That's great. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jesus. Happy birthday to you. Yay. Okay, guys, thank you. Thanks for showing up this morning on time and make it a great day. We have a cake for you.